Hi. Uh, today, um, I'm going to read the January, February of 2019 of End Time Magazine by Urban Baxter. And I, I kind of thought it was kind of interesting because this, uh, today, the president happened to be with this guy here, um, the president of France. So I just thought it'd be interesting to read this. I don't get my opinion. I don't have any opinion, but I just want to read the article. This is from January, and the name of the magazine is The Most Critical Political Debate of Our Time, Globalism versus Nationalism. And so here it is. And I'll try to make it short and sweet. It's about five pages. Quite a conflict has developed between French President Emmanuel Macron and U.S. President Donald Trump over globalism versus nationalism. President Macron is a globalist, while President Trump believes in national sovereignty. Believe it or not, this conflict is playing a major role right now in fulfilling the prophecies of the end time. Globalism. Globalism is the belief that the nation's state structure of our world is obsolete and nations should eliminate their boundaries through globalization, ultimately resulting in one world government. Nationalism. Nationalism is the belief that the world should consist of nation states organized around language, common structure, similar values. Nationalists are opposed to globalism, knowing globalism will ultimately require the surrender of national sovereignty. The origin of globalism. Globalism is not a new concept. It has its roots in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. The incident recorded below happened shortly after Noah's flood. God had told the survivors of the flood to multiply and replenish the earth. Instead, Genesis 11, 1 through 4 tells us what happened. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shiner. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. S-H-I-N-A-R. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go, let us make bread and burn them thoroughly. I'm sorry. Go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for martyr. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The people feared there would be another flood even though God had given the rainbow as a covenant that he would never again destroy the world by water. Not believing God's word, the people decided to build their own plan of salvation. They decided to build a tower to reach into heaven so they could run up into the tower and be saved if there was another flood. This was the origin of man-made religion. In Genesis 11, 5 through 9, we we learn God's reaction to their plan. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down. And there found their language that they may not understand one another's speech. I'm missing a page here. Um, okay. Okay, let me start back. I'm going to go back to the last paragraph. And the Lord came down to see the city 
and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from one from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build a city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the earth, upon the face of all the earth. This incident was the beginning of the different nations and different languages of the world. From that time until today, world leaders have dreamed of bringing nations together and adopting a common language through globalism. It is prophesied in the Bible a world government will be formed in the times just ahead. This is happening right now under the effort called globalism and globalization. One prophecy foretelling a world government for the times just ahead is found in the Old Testament in Daniel 7.23. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it into pieces. Most of the time when the world government has been attempted, the leader has tried to force everyone in his government to adopt the same religious beliefs. The leader of this last day world government will do the same. His actions attempting to force religious conformity are described in Daniel 7, 21 through 22. I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Notice this world government referred to in the above passage will rule until the ancient days comes, Jesus Christ, when Jesus comes. The leader of this final world government is referred to in scripture as the beast or the antichrist. Verse 21 clearly foretells, foretells the antichrist will make war against the saints. This will be a war against Jews and true Christians who will not pledge allegiance to this world government beliefs and requirements. It is interesting that the exact same thing is prophesied in the New Testament. The prophecy is found in Revelation 13, 1 through 2. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw the beast, saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. This last world government is described as a beast composed of a lion, Great Britain, a bear, Russia, a leopard, Germany, and a ten-horned beast, an alliance of ten leaders from Europe. This Europe-centered beast will be the power base of the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 7 tells us this world empire centered in Europe will dominate the world and will prosecute the saints. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. America will not be in the end time world government. Even though the eagle's wings, the United States, were mentioned in Daniel 7 when describing the nations that would be upon the earth in the end time, there's no mention of the eagle, the United States, in Revelation 13 as being part of the end time world government. In the United States, if the United States is not part of the world government of the end time, then what happens to the United States? The answer is found in Revelation 12. 13 through 14, 
one chapter before the prophecy depicting the one world government of the Antichrist. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of great eagle, of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. The woman described in Revelation 12 symbolizes Israel. The 12 stars around her head are the 12 tribes of Israel. This passage clearly depicts the American eagle protecting Israel from the attacks of Satan and his end time world government. Notice the United States continues to protect Israel for a time, times, and half the time. A time is one year, times is two years, and half a time is one half a year. This tells us the U.S. will protect Israel for the final three and a half years, the length of the Great Tri Tribulation. The present struggle between nationalism and globalism. On September 25, 2018, President Trump and Macron spoke to the world at the annual UN General Assembly. President Trump spoke strongly against globalism and for nationalism. President Macron spoke a few hours later on the same podium against nationalism and in favor of globalism. Below are excerpts from each of their speeches. President Trump on sovereignty. We are standing uh, for America and for American people, and we are also standing for the world. This is great news for our citizens and for peace-loving people everywhere. We believe that when nations respect the rights of their neighbors and defend the interests of their people, they can better work together to secure the blessings of safety, prosperity, and peace. That is why America will always choose independence and cooperation over global governance, control, and, denominate, and domination. I honor the right of every nation in this room to pursue its own customs, beliefs, and traditions. The United States will not tell you how to live or work or worship. We only ask that you honor our sovereignty in return. Recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. This year, we also took another significant step forward in the Middle East. In recognition of every sovereign state to determine its own capital, I moved the U.S. Embassy to Israel, in Israel to Jerusalem. The United States is committed to a future of peace and stability in the region, including peace between Israelis and Palestinians. That aim is advanced not harmed by acknowledging the obvious facts. America's policy of principled realism means we will not be held hostage to old dogmas, discredited ideologies, and so-called experts who have been proven wrong over the years time and time again. This is true not only in matters of peace, but in matters of prosperity. International Crimin Criminal Court. For similar reasons, the United States will provide no support and recognition to the international criminal courts. As far as America is concerned, the ICC has no jurisdiction, no legitimacy, and no authority. The ICC claims near universal jurisdiction over the citizens of every country, violating all principles of justice, fairness, and due process. We will never surrender America's sovereignty to an unelected, unaccountable global bureaucracy. America is governed by Americans. We reject the ideology of globalism and we embrace the doctrine of patriotism. Around the world, responsible nations must defend against threats to sovereignty, not just from global governance, but also from other new forms of Co coercion and domination. Sorry, I need to swallow some water. Illegal immigration. 
illegal immigration funds, criminal network, ruthless gangs and flow of deadly drugs. Illegal immigration exploits vulnerable populations, hurts hardworking citizens and has produced a vicious cycle of crime, violence and poverty. Only by upholding national borders, destroying criminal gangs, can we break this cycle and establish a real foundation for prosperity. We recognize the right of every nation in this room to set its own immigration policy in accordance with its national interest, just as we ask other countries to respect our own right to do the same, which we are doing. This is the reason the United States will not participate in the new global compact of migration. Migration should not be governed by an international body unaccountable to our own citizens. Socialism. Currently, we are witnessing a human tragedy. As an example, in Venezuela, more than 2 million people have fled the anguish inflicted by the socialist Maduro regime and its Cuban sponsors. Not long ago, Venezuela was one of the richest countries on earth. Today, socialism has bankrupted the oil-rich nation and driven its people into abject poverty. Virtually everywhere socialism or communism has been tried, it has produced suffering, corruption, and decay. Socialism thirst for power leads to expansion, incursion, and oppression. All nations of the world should resist socialism and the misery that it brings to everyone, sovereign and independent nations. To unleash this incredible potential in our people, we must defend the foundations that make it all possible. Sovereign and independent nations are the only vehicle from freedom, only vehicle where freedom has ever survived democracy has ever endured, or peace has ever prospered. And so we must protect our sovereignty and our cherished independence above all. President Macron on Globalism. What I, what I am saying is that this path of unilateralism leads us directly to withdrawal and conflict, to widespread confrontation between everyone, to the detriment of all even eventually of those who believe they are the strongest. Middle East conflict. What will make it possible to resolve the crisis between Israel and Palestine? Not unilateral initiatives or ignoring the legitimate rights of the Palestinians to achieve sustainable peace or underestimating the legitimate right of Israelis to their security. There is no credible alternative to the solution of two states living side by side in peace or se and security with Jerusalem as their capital. Three principles. The new equilibrium that we must create must be based on new forms of regional and international cooperation and will, I believe, be based on three principles. Firstly, respect for sovereignty, which is at the very foundation of our charter, Secondly, the strengthening of our regional cooperation. And thirdly, the provision of more robust international guarantees. Author note, his three principles contradict each other. Respect for sovereignty and more robust international guarantees are diametrically opposed. Multilateralism. You see, my dear friends, I believe deeply in the sovereignty of peoples, which today is strong and present and demand by, demanded by all of our people on the international stage. But at the same time, I believe in a strengthened cooperation taking multiple forms and in the renewed legitimacy of international engagement in its context. The great battle of our forerunners was the fight for peace, which is still incumbent upon us. We will only win that battle in the 21st century by restoring a strong multilateral system capable of resolving conflicts. But I do believe in universal values and in one way and in no way will I yield the principle of the sovereignty of people to nationalists or to those in an international 
community who advocate retreating inwards, who want to use the sovereignty of peoples to attack the universality of our values. Their strength is what keeps us all here in this room. Paris Climate Agreement. The heralded breakdown of the Paris Agreement has been averted because we've managed to remain united despite the American decision to withdraw from it. Let's commit ourselves clearly and let's all be equally clear, concrete, and coherent. It is an emergency, so let's comply with the commitments we've made. Let's sign no more trade agreements with powers that don't respect the Paris Agreement. Author note. Here's the author's note. He's calling a trade boycott of America. The global collective system. But today it must also help create coalitions enabling the global collective system to be furthered and rebuilt. Definition of collectivism. Number one. A political or economic theory advocating collective control, especially over production and distribution, a system marked by such control. Number two, emphasis on collective rather than individual action or identity from the Merriam Dictionary, Webster Dictionary. Mater multilateralism. Ladies and gentlemen, at a time when our collective system is breaking up, I must say we have never needed it so much. We will therefore support the agencies working for a project of peace and humanity. UNESCO, U-N-E-S-C-O, the very conscience of the United Nations, the Human Rights Council, the International Criminal Court, and UNRWA, for which we will increase our contribution because I recommend you, I remind you here, it is simply about enabling hundreds of thousands of children to go to school. Nothing more, nothing less. We will support the enlargement of the Security Council and its members, two categories, so that its composition reflects contemporary balances and is strengthened as a place of consultation and not obstruction. We will ensure that the by, by the end of the year at this General Assembly, two thirds of its members can support the suspension of the right of veto in the event of mass atrocities. France will be there to ensure the world does not forget the den of nationalism always leads to the abyss. So I say to you very clearly, the century which has begun is wa watching us and our children are waiting for us. Let's resolve the crisis. Let's work together to combat all these inequalities, but let's do so in a human way with the stringency of our principles, our history, passionately driven by our universalism. Whose argument will prevail? According to the Bible's prophecy for the near future, Macron's argument for globalism and one world government will prevail for a short time. However, not all nations will come under the control of the world government. America, Israel, and Jordan, and perhaps a few others will maintain their sovereignty, refusing to submit to the world government of the Antichrist. The prophesied world government will usher in the worst tyranny the world has ever known. In its arrogance, it will invade Israel to force the division of Jerusalem. This will result in the Battle of Armageddon, which will trigger the second coming of Jesus to the earth. Jesus returns to take over his world. The world government of the Antichrist will be destroyed at the second coming of Jesus to the earth. The event is recorded in Daniel 7, 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days, 
did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Revelation 11.15 gives another account of the same event that happens at the last trump. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord, and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. The most complete account of the takeover of the world by Jesus is found in Revelation 19, 11 through 15. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. No more war. Once Jesus replaces the governments of this world with his long-awaited kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom of God will begin. Jesus will teach the nations the path to peace and righteousness. Isaiah 2.4 tells us that God's kingdom tells us about God's kingdom upon the earth. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So that was uh, nation versus nation in time. And I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.